It's always uh, nice to have the first session on a Friday morning at the end of a meeting. Um, lots of uh, <laughs> lots of bright uh, bright faces, including myself. Um, but um, thank you for uh, being here bright and early as I talk to you all about blood pressure targets. And um, I know that you know a, a, a lot of what we've done with blood pressure research has tried to identify different thresholds and and values in different settings in critical care and. In, in, in the perioperative space and there are different aspects of critical care. And my hope is that uh, today I, I'm able to give you, um, instead of giving you a lot of data, and there's going to be a lot of data on these slides, a lot of numbers, but my hope is that at the end of the talk uh, that we'll have some time for discussion and that I'm able to give you a, a, a better perspective on thinking beyond a map of 65, uh, which, you know, we all know that, that a map of 65 is important, and, and you know you all wouldn't be in this room if if you if that was the end of the of the story. Um, my apologies up front if the, this this is going to be this is going to be data heavy. There's there's going to be a, a number of studies and a number of um, blood pressure thresholds I'll talk about. But then I hope we can all bring it together in the end and have a, a meaningful discussion for for about five minutes. So um, here we go. Again, uh, I don't know if you've been to my talks at this meeting. Um, uh, this is this is me. This is the this is the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, where I live. It's a very pretty part of the country. So, if anyone uh, wants to visit us, you're you're more than welcome. Um, and this is where I work at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. It's a 900-bedded uh, tertiary care uh, hospital in um, Central North Carolina. Um, my affiliations and uh, my, my relevant disclosures, not, not, none of this is going to be a conflict of interest during my talk today. So as I said, this, this is going to be a little bit of a hemodynamics journey. Um, you know, we're, we're going to look at different aspects of critical care and how we target blood pressure. Very importantly, um, what I'm going to talk about in terms of targets will be a combination of both the amount and duration of hypotension. So people often talk about blood pressure. They say, well, you know, my patient's hypotensive, but I don't, I don't think that does justice to the problem of blood low blood pressure because a, a map of 60 for five minutes is different from a map of 60 for five minutes that recovers for two minutes and goes back down to map of 60 for five minutes, comes back again, versus a map of 60 for a continuous of 15 minutes or 10 minutes, versus a sharp drop to a, a, a map of 50 and, and a bounce back in two minutes, right? Different morphologies of hypotension. And uh, we and others do believe there's the shape of that curve that does affect organ system failure. So it's not enough to just quantitate and say, well, my patient's hypotensive. When I talk about hypotension and targets in the ICU, I think this is still the, the seminal work, right? So Puri as far, the sepsis PAM trial, high versus low blood pressure targets in the ICU, 776 septic shock patients, and, and two targets, so a high target of a map of 80 to 85, and a low target of a map of 65 to 70. Um, for those who've uh, done a deeper dive into, into this, if my pointer is showing, for those who've done a deeper dive into this work, when they actually did the trial, the high blood pressure group ended up being 85 to 90, and the low blood pressure group ended up being 70 to 75. So in the end, it was actually a trial of two relatively high pressures, or maybe a normal to high or a high pressure, rather than really being a trial of a truly low target versus a truly high target. And, and I, I think that really exemplifies the problem of doing randomized controlled trials for blood pressure in the ICU, that it's very difficult to maintain a low pressure target for various reasons, right? We end up giving vasopressors, we end up giving fluids. The pressure 
always is more than 65 in your low target. Obviously, if you get lower than 65, there is always the ethical concern whether you can truly make your patient hypotensive to prove your point because we do know that hypotension is bad. So this work is now almost 10 years old and it is still the largest randomized trial of blood pressure targets and septic shock patients in the ICU. And as you can see up here, the cumulative survival curves are there's no difference whatsoever, right? So what did Pierre Aspar's work tell us? So if it told us that there is no difference in mortality, why was this work important? It did tell us a few things that are not on my slide here. Number one, and some of you already know this, in patients who were randomized to the low blood pressure target, which remember was was stated as 65 to 70, but was actually 70 to 75, and they had pre-existent chronic hypertension, those patients had significantly more renal injury. So if you start hypertensive, and then you get a slightly lower pressure, which was actually not that low in this case, it was 70 to 75, right? They still had more renal injury than the high target group. The high target group also had lots and lots of more arrhythmias, likely because they used catecholamines to push the pressure up to 85 or 90, and we all know that catecholamines kick the heart. So more arrhythmias on one side, some renal injury on the other side, especially in those who are chronically hypertensive. Bottom line, still no difference in survival. So we say, oh, okay, we're okay with a map of 65. But should we really be saying that based on the results of this trial? I would argue not. So let's see what, what else has been done. So this is our work with uh, Dan Sessler and, and Kamal Maheshwari. We looked at about 11,000 patients out of a large electronic ICU data set in the United States. And this was, these, was, these were all comers in the ICU, not just septic shock, these were surgical ICU patients as well. And rather than look at the figure, the, the, the important text is in the yellow box here. So we looked at a time-weighted average of pressure. So for every one unit of decrease in a time-weighted average map less than 65, the odds of in-hospital mortality went up by about 10%. And the odds of AKI went up by about 7%. You all will say, I just sent a map of 65. We need to think beyond that. But I've again put a headline here saying a map of 65 is critical in the ICU. Well, I, again, a map of 65 remains critical. You get below a map of 65, organ system failure does start. Um, but also understand that Despite the surviving sepsis guidelines telling us that we should be more careful with a map of 65, we should push our patients to get beyond a map of 65, we don't quite get there. So this is the MIMIC-3 data set. You all are, this is out of uh, uh, the, the Harvard group. And what we did here is that we looked at patients who dropped below a map of 65, a map of 60, and a map of 55, patients with septic shock and with vasopressors already on board. And we identify lot, lots and lots of hypotension. So for example, um, I'm highlighting here patients who went beyond two hours to up to four hours with maps less than various thresholds. Despite knowing the evidence around 65, we're not doing a great job getting there. So two thirds of patients were still below a map of 65 for at least two hours. A third of the uh, patients were below a map of 60, but 20% patients were below a map of 55. And this is sort of representative of the scenario today, right? So we know the map of, a map of 65 is important. We're trying our best to get there. We're still struggling to get there. And then there's also that evidence that suggests there's always not a map of 65. There's also patients who deserve a higher map. So the, the situation is, is fairly complicated in terms of us doing a good job. So what happens when patients drop below uh, the, the various thresholds? Understand that this is a retrospective analysis, so lots of confounders, but the, sorry, the, the mortality does go up pretty significantly, right? So if you start right here with almost no time spent at low blood pressure thresholds, the mortality is next to nothing, it's less than 20%, and there's a steady up climb. So for example, MAP less than 55, 
um, and, and you stay there for about 10 hours, the mortality has gone up to 60 to 70 percent. So retrospective analysis, lots of confounders, maybe the patients who were hypotensive were already so sick and they were going to die in any case, right? But the signal is loud and clear that we're not doing a great job managing hypotension and when we don't do a great job, then patients don't survive. Going back to our analysis that I just showed you in the intensive care medicine, we also looked at different MAP thresholds. So look at the x-axis here um, and look at mortality, AKI, and myocardial injury. MAP of 85, 75, 65, 55. The, the odds of mortality, AKI, and myocardial injury start increasing at anything below a MAP of 85, and they progressively go up, right? People say, well, you know, MAP of 85, that's not, oh, we can't get to a MAP of 85. I can tell you I'm, I'm probably higher than a MAP of 85 right now, and most of you in the room are at least at a MAP of 80 to 85. Why wouldn't you guys, if you, God forbid, were to get sick tomorrow morning, deserve at least the map that you live at, right? Why are we all happy then with a map of 65? Understand that the surviving sepsis guidelines say target a minimum map of 65 during the initial phase of resuscitation. They do not say target a daily map of 65 when you walk around in the ICU doing your rounds. Once you're beyond the early phase of resuscitation and your patient has stabilized, then try and get to a map that your patient lived at before getting into the ICU. That is my mantra on rounds, and that is what I tell my trainees and I try to do in practice, and that is what I would want done on myself as well. By the way, if I were to ever get sick, please don't give me a map of 65 three days after my illness. So is a map of 65 a target of the past? Uh, the, Marlies and Pierre Asfar himself wrote an editorial for our work that I just highlighted. And what they say is a few things. A, that we need to repeat a sepsis spam like trial again. B, that we need to look at perfusion pressure. So they here, they say mean perfusion pressure is MAP minus CVP. Whether mean perfusion pressure is a better resuscitation target for patients with shock is unknown. And it's also unclear whether specific organ-specific perfusion targets are necessary. 10 years out from sepsis, bam, we still haven't done a perfusion pressure guided trial. We need to think about doing that. Is it MAP or is it perfusion pressure then? That should have been the title of my talk today, right? So maybe it should have been perfusion pressure targets. Bernd Sagel has really put this beautifully in this editorial. I always bring this up on my slides. It's a balance between outflow pressure and driving pressure, cardiac output, MAP, vascular resistance on one side, outflow pressure on the other side, and especially in patients who are fragile, patients who are older, patients who have chronic hypertension, we need to look at perfusion pressure and not just that map of 65. And folks have actually done retrospective work. So this is out of the ANZIX group in Australia. Um, Rakshit Panwar is the first author. They identified mean perfusion pressure being a difference of MAP minus CVP, and they saw that a mean perfusion pressure deficit and percentage time spent below mean perfusion pressure for deficit more than 20% were all significantly associated with the probability of uh, death within the first two weeks of ICU admission. And, and the probability was largely similar or slightly stronger than a MAP deficit as a time-weighted average. So, so again, the evidence is building around mean perfusion pressure. One of the problems that we've identified is the fact that we don't measure mean perfusion pressure all the time. The only time when we actually do it is when we have a central line. We don't always have a central line, and we don't always use a CVP if we have a central line. So what we did was we took a Foley catheter, a specialized Foley catheter, that could continuously measure intra-abdominal pressure to the tune of an intra-abdominal pressure reading every 10 seconds or so. And we put it on our, all of our post-cardiac surgery patients in our ICU. We did this in a prospective observational manner. There were several other centers, but this is a small part of the data that we published. And what we've shown is that there's lots and lots of intra-abdominal pressure that is way higher than normal. So for example, if you follow my arrows, about a fifth of our patients had at least about 10 hours of an intra-abdominal pressure, more than 20, 
which you all will identify as a high intra-abdominal pressure. And, and then again, there was even a higher uh, percentage of patients that had intra-abdominal pressures more than 15, right? If you go to the other side of my slide in the red font, if you look at what I've tried to describe here, renal perfusion pressure or abdominal perfusion pressure is the difference between MAP or CVP slash intra-abdominal pressure, right? MAP minus CVP slash intra-abdominal pressure. We want to target a renal perfusion pressure of 60, but if our intra-abdominal pressure is always holding out at 10 or 15 without us knowing, and we're targeting a MAP of 65, then the kidneys are suffering, right? Without us knowing. So we don't measure perfusion pressure continuously. We should be doing it, and there's methods to do it. Uh, if you guys are more interested, this is a nice review we wrote with Manu Malbrain and, and a special uh, insight issue of ICM. I encourage all, you all to look at it when you have time for more information on, on intra-abdominal pressure. So how about blood pressure components in the ICU? For now, I've focused on MAP and, and systolic pressure. Um, oh, sorry, I've focused on MAP and perfusion pressure, but is systolic pressure in the ICU important? Is diastolic pressure important? Is, is pulse pressure important? So another large retrospective analysis, this time from the EICU data set, and some very interesting results. So in a sepsis cohort of nearly 80,000 patients, we identified thresholds, and then in a, within that cohort, there were patients who had septic shock, another 4,000 patients. The first thing that's evident here, if you look at the um, blood pressure components as a standardized scale on the x-axis and the predicted probability of ICU mortality on the y-axis, that MAP and systolic pressure appear to travel together and diastolic pressure does, does not seem to have as much of an increase in predicted probability, and pulse pressure appears to have the weakest signal. Slightly surprising, I personally thought that diastolic pressure would be as important as the other components. But on the other hand, and, and again, I, to, I warned you when I started, there's going to be a lot of numbers. Um, if we look at what we've identified, we've identified, say, for example, looking at a diastolic pressure uh, mean of 44, for the septic shock patients, uh, a deviation to two and a half standard deviations or on a lower side of the diastolic pressure to 24, so follow this here, increases the predicted probability of ICU mortality to about 15 to upwards of 15% to about 20% here, right? And you can follow these numbers for each of all of the components. So lots of numbers. But the guidance here is that we should still follow MAP-based resuscitation, but there is also an opportunity with trials like Andromeda Shock 2, with which colleagues like Jan Barker and Glenn Hernandez are doing, to, to actually look at diastolic pressure, increase norepinephrine based on diastolic pressure, and see if that makes a difference. For those who are interested, obviously the full manuscript has lots and lots of details. Here is another way we looked at things. We, uh, we looked at pressure maintained for at least two hours below thresholds for each component of blood pressure in our cohort, and we identified change points for diastolic, pulse pressure, systolic, and, and MAP. You'll identify that some of these change points are commonly used in resuscitation practice. Some are slightly higher than what we commonly use. But again, the opportunity here is to develop trials, interventional trials, that will target blood pressure components in the ICU rather than just MAP. And again, uh, I'll leave this up here for you guys, but all of this is available in the full manuscript. I will not get into details, but you can identify, again, these are change points that we, that we look at all the time, right? Septic shock patients, lowest MAP for two hours, a MAP of 59, lowest systolic of 97, lowest diastolic of, of 49, right? These are pressures for it maintained for at least two hours. So these are relevant thresholds and change points. So what about hypotension in the surgical ICU, right? For those of us who, who work in that setting, patients gone from the operating room to the ICU. This is work that we published about four years ago, 3,000 patients out of a surgical ICU. And again, we uh, identified that compared to a median map of 87, as the pressure dropped, for every about 10 units of a pressure drop that you see here, there is a nonlinear, almost a quadratic increase in the odds of um, hazards, ratio, hazards of myocardial injury and mortality as a composite outcome. So by the time you get to like a map of 65 or so, that hazards has almost gone up to two. 
right? Again, folks said, well, you know, this is too high of a pressure. Again, my argument, this is pressure, this is lower pressure than, than we normally live with. So hypotension is extremely important in the post-operative ICU. And we did the same for acute kidney injury, almost a, a linear straight line here as map trot below 87 kept on uh, the, the, the odds of a poor outcome increased. And again, um, if you look at patients who start normotensive in the operating room, then go to the post-operative ICU, we did an, another analysis that we recently published in Critical Care, where we looked at stronger outcomes like 30-day MACE, 30-day mortality, and 90-day mortality along with AKI. And we, we identified a map somewhere between 65 and 75 that appears to be critical. So. Like I warned you when I started, lots and lots and lots of numbers, but not meant to confuse you, only meant to tell you that we have to think beyond a map of 65 in different ICU settings. This is a cardiogenic shock population in a coronary ICU, and where is that upward uh, uh, slant in mortality is around a map of 70-ish, where the mortality starts increasing. And, and you know, by the time you get to a map of 60, that mortality has gone up to about 60%, right? So it's not just us, you know, everywhere where we do these large database analyses, we've identified higher blood pressure thresholds. The other thing I want to talk to you about is when you intubate your patients in the intensive care unit. We, we're always worried that patient's unstable, we intubate, and the pressure drops further, uh, and then we're all scrambling trying to restore that blood pressure. We developed a post-intubation hypotension prediction index uh, with colleagues at the Society of Critical Care Medicine. We identified that intubation in the setting of a map less than 65 uh, or a systolic below 130 were two predictors, important predictors in this hypotension prediction index. Im and importantly, when we use this index to predict outcomes, this score itself was very strongly predictive of outcomes such as ICU death, hospital death, and, and, and other 28-day outcomes such as ventilator free days and ICU free days. So the, the score itself started from a low of less than 1.5 and then went all the way up to a very high score of more than 19. And if you march across these columns here, all of this is statistically significant and the, the, the very strong outcomes right here increase all the way across. So if your patients are more likely to get hypotensive after intubation in the ICU, they're more likely to die within the hospital. And now we have indices and scores to look at this. Again, this is a, a close up of what I just said. ICU death increases as the index itself increases. And the, at, at the x axis here is the odds ratio for the hypotension prediction score. What else? Uh, we, we need to look at brain health. So delirium is an important outcome in the ICU. And, and with Kamal Maheshwari and Dan Sessler, we, we, we looked at this, again, retrospective data set where we identified a map of 75 being that threshold below and above which delirium and, and neurocognitive outcomes worsened. Again, this was retrospective. But Pierre, as far as group, also did a post hoc analysis, similar post hoc analysis. So they looked at their high and low blood pressure target groups. And they found that patients who were maintained on the high blood pressure target group in the sepsis PAM trial had better arousal scores. Their minimal RAS scores were higher than those who were maintained on the low blood pressure target. Although the counter argument here is that if you look at these RAS scores, although they're statistically significant, there's that difference. I don't know if they're clinically significant, right? So it's RAS score of a negative three versus a negative two. Does, or a negative four and a half to a, a negative three and a half, does that make too much of a difference? Uh, you could argue not, not really, although the, 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 the signal is interesting. So as I'm reaching the end of my talk, uh, I'm going to ask you, well, have we really defined a mean arterial pressure? Are we there yet? And I think the arguments I, I write in this editorial are we don't have granular data in ICUs. We really need to hone in on beat-to-beat -beat data for all of hemodynamics in all ICUs across the world, if you need to establish population-based trends. And number two, I don't think we're doing justice only looking at maps. So we need to rethink our strategies because then there's trials like this, right? You've seen the very famous uh, tr trial here where they compared usual care to permissive hypotension. So 
the permissive hypotension was dropping a map to less than 65, so a map between 60 to 65, or usual care being a map of at least 65, and there's no difference whatsoever in a randomized trial. Now, the argument here could be, was it really the blood pressure that made a difference or, or less exposure to vasopressors slash catecholamines? Can the, it, it becomes really interesting when we start doing prospective trials. We, we mostly en end up with negative trials or trials don't, that don't see a difference, right? Um, the, the few other things I want to talk to you about is the area we don't focus on is our patients on hospital wards. I believe that all hypotension and all damage actually starts there. We don't pick up sepsis on time. We don't pick up septic shock on time on the hospital floor. We don't pick up the hypotensive patient on the hospital floor that sits around for six hours till a nurse comes and checks on them. And then we transfer the patient to the ICU. And then we think that there's acute kidney injury the next morning because of hypotension that happened in the ICU. No, it's really hypotension that happened on the floor. So we did this neat experiment where we put wireless wearable monitoring on patients on the hospital floor and we blinded that monitoring device and silenced all the alarms. And what did we find? We find that lots of patients on the floor are hypotensive. A fifth of our patients dropped to a map less than 65 for about 15 continuous minutes. Importantly, spot checks, that was intermittent nursing, monitoring of blood pressure on the floor, missed about 50% of hypotensive episodes on the floor. These are your patients who come back to your ICUs with septic shock, but we don't pick up their hypotension in time, and then we worry. Uh, we're also doing work at, at my institution uh, where we have wireless wearable monitoring as a standard of care on the floor. This is 15,000 patients at my institution, and this is unpublished uh, under review right now but uh, about 10% of our patients, so less hypotension at, at, at my institution because we already have active alarms and interventions. This is our standard of care. About 10% of our patients had a MAP less than 70 for 30 continuous minutes compared to the other analyses that, uh, that was a study rather than, that, than real world data that I present to you. So this part is interesting. The frequency of measurement is also really important. Uh, I won't go into depths of that discussion today. We obviously want to get to non-invasive continuous blood pressure monitoring. We don't have all the tools as of today. The problem in the red font is that invasive lines are restricted to sicker patients. They're associated with more complications. We tend to take them out quickly, but patients get hypotensive after we take out our invasive lines and we have no ways to measure that uh, number. And then we don't have that data. A lot of the, my retrospective analysis is limited by the fact that I didn't have granular data capture. So the, that's one problem. The other problem, microcirculation. I talked to you about blood pressure targets, 65, 70, 8, 75, 85. Does that equate to good microcirculation here? Probably not. Uh, if you guys can play these clips, please. Can you play these clips? So on the left is a healthy uh, microcirculation, uh, sublingual capillary blood flow. On the right is a septic shock uh, with three vasopressors on. And if these people, can you play these video clips? Okay. Okay, well, if they, if they would play, I could show you that the right-sided circulation is sluggish. Well, there we go. Right-sided circulation is sluggish compared to the left side. These are patients with exactly the same blood pressure. And this is part of our angiotensin trial. But what I'm trying to tell you here is blood pressure is okay, but beyond a point, if we don't know microcirculation, then just targeting that number is not exactly the best way to do things. The other thing we don't know is we don't measure cardiac output continuously at all in the ICU. We do it for very specific patients, We're the, the ones that we are concerned about. The problem is as follows. Uh, normally, so look at this patient, the SVR is 800, trending to the lower side. Cardiac output is stable about five to six here, right? Uh, MAP is 70 and starting to drop here. Someone has probably given some phenylephrine here, an afterload increasing agent. SVR has increased and keeps on increasing nicely. The MAP also responds nicely. Normally, we only have MAP and SVR. We're very happy with this result. But the cardiac output has gone off to the other side. After that initial increase, it's actually trending down. It's about four now, right? 
That is the problem. We assume all of our patients are on the right side of the Frank Starling curve. A lot of our patients who come in with pre-existing diastolic dysfunction and or heart failure that's not picked up are, should not be given after load increasing agents as the only agents to increase blood pressure in the absence of continuous cardiac output monitoring in the ICU. And finally, as I conclude, the overall emphasis needs to be to get us here on the proactive side of management of hypotension in the ICU rather than waiting for the blood pressure to drop, then we start running to get something, vasopressor ordered, fluids done, two hours later, the patient's still hypotensive. We need to be somewhere here in this yellow to manage all of our hypotension. This is something that we're doing at our institution and, and hopefully we'll have the results for you in the next year or, or maybe less than that. We're randomizing patients to a machine learning guided algorithm looking at management of hypotension, both in the cardiac operating room and in the first eight hours of ICU stay. So hopefully more to follow in terms of proactive management of hypotension. And with that, I come to the end of this hemodynamics journey open for questions. Thank you. I'm sorry, I gave you like two seconds for questions, but uh, uh, 30 seconds or um, but I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, in your presentation, you said that you strive uh, to maintain higher MAP thresholds, like above 80 or 85. Uh, but at the same time, we are um, the, the, the trials with peripheral perfusion are coming up uh, in recent years, uh, and in which we know that blood pressure is not everything and we have to assess peripheral perfusion and in my practice I usually encounter patients who have an MAP of like 60 and CRT of one second would you administer more catecholamines in that patient I would not okay um, so again uh, after the results of Andromeda shock came out I think we've reinvigorated the, the bedside clinical examination with capillary refill time which is obviously great news mm. um, I think that I, I still worry that uh, there is a little inter-observer variation between capillary refill time, right? People sometimes don't get it right all, all the time, right? Um, if I had better measures of microcirculation available to me, so in, in, in the dream world, if I had like sublingual capillary flow that I could see uh, with, with, a, with a probe that I could put under the tongue that was readily available, then I would better titrate my pressors based on flow as well as macro hemodynamics. So, currently, mm -hmm. sorry, just to finish my, currently um, I go with the assumption that till a certain map, I'm not compromising flow. Although with the caveat that if my patient is on three pressors and has a lactate of six, then I know that whatever I might do, I'm probably already compromising flow. Just to finish that, please, but go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah, essentially you answered my question, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we should not really uh, resuscitate, uh, over-resuscitate patient if, if the capillary fit time is within normal ranges? Absolutely. Uh, even if the MAP is like below 60 maybe? Like, uh, this happens <laughs> to me. <laughs> now, you're putting me on the spot, but absolutely, but what I do in clinical practice is if you then give me a patient who's 75 years old and has three vessel coronary artery disease, then I would start worrying as I go below MAP of 60. Okay. Even if the capillary refill time is okay. okay. Yeah. I don't want to take that risk. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, uh, thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Khanna. Um, I really like the, the, um, your, your approach to targeting the the map that people live at and i was just wondering because often we don't know that how do you approach that how do you go about that in your clinical practice yeah so sort of, sort of similar question so again um i didn't have time but i always worry about how we define the map we live at right so if i look at a patient's chart when a patient comes into the icu the only other documentation that's there, at, at least in the US, is either the last visit to a, a primary care uh, doctor, or if the patient's coming into the operating room, the blood pressure in the preoperative holding area, all of those pressures are definitely higher than pressures they live at at home. And then we are like, oh, this, this guy is like, oh, he lives at a 
systolic of 160 and let me just keep my pressures around that. I worry about that approach. Uh, Bernd Sagal has done some neat work where he's actually put ambulatory continuous blood pressure monitoring on patients in the preoperative area and he's identified that those pressures are very different from the first pre-induction blood pressure, right? And, um, you know, we, we are trying to do some work where we're trying to send people home uh, from our pre-anesthesia clinic with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring so that so we can have a range of pressures recorded for about a week and then ask them to bring that data back to us. So it doesn't apply all the way to ICU patients because they come through the emergency room, right? But if, if we had our smartwatches doing this trick for us that I could just simply come and hand over my smartwatch to my intensivist and say, hey, this is my physiology. This is where I live at, at home when I'm healthy. And please target that. Please try and match that. That is the world we're heading towards. I don't think it's, uh, it's sort of a dream. I think everyone's got a smartwatch that, that records what we're doing. I think that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>